I think next on our list here is, uh, you know, I have a baptism that throws me all off because I'm not out here for the worship service. <laughs> and, but it was sounding really good back there. How was it sounding in here? Was that great? Yeah. There were some songs there I really, really like. And we're talking today about faithfulness. Faithfulness. And the question is, what is faithfulness? Well, we discovered what faithful, faithfulness is at Yellowstone Park. <laughs> Anybody ever been there? Yeah, I see a few hands, yeah. Uh, we were going into Yellowstone Park and uh, we were racing to get to uh, the one known as Old Faithful. And as we were racing in, I was reminding my wife that thing goes off like uh, almost every hour on the hour, give or take a couple minutes, but it goes off. Year round, it always does that. And I said, so it may have just gone off and we might have to, we might have to wait a little while for this thing to go off. And I said, or we could get there and it would just wait a few minutes. Well, we were walking up and it took off. <laughs> and it blasted. I and mean, we didn't have any waiting time. I mean, it was just boom, there it was. And we were just totally shocked. I mean, it was, it was just incredible. But, but it's been, this geyser has been given the name Old Faithful. Why old? Because as long as you know, it's been doing it. And faithful is because you can almost set your clock to it. It's, it's reliable. It's dependable. Uh, it's trustworthy. You know it's going to happen. And, and that's the quality that I want to look at today. Faithfulness is the quality that the Holy Spirit produces that shows up as reliability and trustworthiness. All right, and there's our first two blanks in your bulletin to fill out. All right. It, it shows up as reliable and trustworthiness. So who has faithfulness? Well, I want to start out by saying God does. God is faithful. In fact, twice in the New Testament, that is the expression. God is faithful. You can count on God. You can depend on him. Other people are faithful too. I know this because the Apostle Paul says, Timothy, my son. Now, Timothy isn't really his biological son, but he's his son in the faith. He says, Timothy, my son, whom I love, who is faithful in the Lord. So other people have faithfulness. And then the last one I want to touch base on is uh, you can have faithfulness too. That could be a description of you. Faithful, reliable, dependable. The Bible puts it this way. Those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. God has given everybody here something for which you can prove faithful. You can be faithful. We can all be faithful. So how does faithfulness actually show up in God? Well, I got a few ways in which it actually shows up. First of all, I call this a providential one. In God's providence. Now you're probably saying, I'm not sure what the word providence means. Well, if you were to look it up in a theology book, it would say the continued exercise of the divine energy by which God created the heavens and the earth. That same power of God, okay? We got that part of the definition out of the way? It's God, all his almighty power, he runs and operates and controls the universe that he has created to take it to his intended goal. Wow, that's a pretty big definition. Okay, for this concept. All it means is this, is this, is that God is in control of everything. Everything. God is providential. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. You see, in his providence, he has taken your world, everything in it, and he's put it in a box. He's got control of it. He allows what enters your life, what happens in your life, everything. He's in control of that. And he controls it in such a way it's never more than you can handle. You say, you've got to be kidding. I've had a few things in my life I can't handle. Well, you say that, but God says, no. I've given you what you can handle. Nothing more. You can handle this. Most people, I say, I can't. But the real answer is, they won't. <laughs> There's a big difference between saying, I won't, I refuse to, and I can't, that I don't have the ability to. What this passage is saying is that God 
controlling everything, never gives you a temptation. The same word temptation can mean trial or test or problem or difficulty. God never gives you more than you can handle. God is faithful. I've gone through some pretty difficult times in my life. And I felt like, God, where are you? And God is saying, I'm faithful. I'm right here. I've given you no more than you can handle if you trust me. The remainder of this verse goes on to say, he says, God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able to bear, but he will also make a way of escape. He'll open a door so that there will be a way out. Actually, he says, so that you can stand up under it. He doesn't take your problems away. That's not the, what, the answer to it. The answer is he makes you strong enough so that you can endure the pressure while you trust in him. God is faithful. The problem that I have is I don't trust in God. I think this is, I'm, I'm, I'm big enough to handle this one myself. I, I'm always amazed when people said, you know, man, I can't believe God answered my prayer and did that. And then I say, well, you prayed and you didn't expect him to do anything? You see, God is faithful. And he will, he's got your whole world in a box. He is controlling everything. And he's only allowing into your life what you can handle, what you can handle. The second passage I, I come to is found in 2 Thessalonians cha channel, uh, chapter 3 and verse 3. It says, but the Lord is faithful. There it is again. The Lord is faithful. He will strengthen you. So he says he's going to strengthen you. The Apostle Paul in the Philippians says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. God gives us a power to overcome whatever it is in our life that is an obstacle, a hindrance, a trial, a temptation, a problem. He empowers us. Uh, here's the Henderson translation of that, okay? God infuses his strength in us. You see, God Almighty dwells within me. I just have to tap that power that's within me in God. And I do that by trusting in him and not my own arm of strength. God is faithful to empower you to overcome whatever the problem is that you face in life. The third thing I see is faithful. The Lord is faithful to protect you from the evil one. Remember the 23rd Psalm? Many of you memorized it as a child. There's a line in there, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. That's scary, isn't it? You're walking down through a valley and death is casting its shadow on your path. This is like, I'm going to die, okay? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. What do we fear most? Death. I mean, pain and death, okay? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For you are with me. I used to have this expression, you know, uh, God plus one is a majority, and somebody said, that's not quite right. God without you is a majority, <laughs> So when God is with me, all right, I'm on the winning side. I, I'm on the winning side. He's going to protect me to accomplish his purpose. Now, now sometimes it doesn't seem like he's protection, protecting, but God works all things together for good. We saw that last week. And, and it's the concept here of God's providence. God's working everything together for good. He is going to protect me so that I can walk confidently through the shadow of the, the valley of the shadow of death and not fear any evil because he's with me. He's with me. The text says he is faithful to forgive. All right, I'm going to ask a question. Everybody here who truly believes that they are perfect, please raise their hand. Everybody look around. I'm looking for the one hand to go up. All right. Always, there's usually a joker who raises his hand and says, okay, I might not be perfect, but give me a week. <laughs> In most cases, it's going to take a lot longer than that. We're not perfect. 
We all fall short of perfection. Jesus said, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Anybody there? No, we all fall short. The Bible says, be holy as I am holy. That's what God says. Uh, anybody as holy as God? Nope. So we've all fallen short, and the Bible says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's what sin is. It's just that I don't measure up to perfection. So I qualify to be a sinner, one who's fallen short of perfection. It says if we confess our sins, that what I've blown it, how I've blown it, doesn't matter if it's a big one, murder, Moses was a murderer, or if it's a little one, a little white lie. It doesn't matter what the sin is. is if, if we confess where we have fallen short, he is faithful. Not only is he faithful, but God is righteous to do so. He is just to forgive us. I got the rope up there. You see that rope? That's uh, our guilt. You see, what happens when I sin against God I have something attached to my soul called guilt. Guilt is a legal term which means I must satisfy justice. When the judge says, you are guilty, then they comes, you now have an obligation to satisfy justice. He then gives the sentence of what the justice is you must satisfy. So the moment I sin, I have guilt. I'm a guilty sinner. But he says, if I just confess what I've done wrong, he is faithful and just to forgive. Now, the word forgive means to release, to let go. God lets go of my sin. Well, where did he let it go to? He let it go to the cross where Jesus suffered, bled, and died, the just for the unjust. And God is faithful to cleanse me from all unrighteousness because he let it go from me to Jesus. And so now I am free. I'm, I've been purged of my sin. I'm purified from all unrighteousness. I stand before God completely pure, accepted, pardoned, forgiven. And the Bible says that's all because God is faithful. God is faithful. You ever gone to a prayer and confessing your sin and you're praying and say, God, I did it again. And God says, what do you mean again? Because when he forgave you, he let it go, never to hold you accountable for that again. Jesus died for it. It's been dealt with. It's been dealt with. He's faithful and just to forgive me of my sins so that I have a standing with God. This is powerful. God is faithful and just to forgive us. So how does faithfulness show up in us? That's a good question. How does faithfulness show up in us? Well, I found this verse in Timothy. We read it last spring when we were going through the, the book of Timothy. It says, no widow may be placed on the list of widows. There was a widow's role in the church because there was no social security system, and the church was taking care of the widows, but they had to be a widow indeed, if you remember, not just any widow. She had certain qualifications she had to meet, and, and a couple of them are here. She has to be over 60. He said, if you're under 60, go get married. <laughs> go find a man. Let him take care of you, not the church. And so, but if you're over 60, but it adds this, it adds this to it. And has been faithful to her husband. She's been faithful. I think I told you a story about the guy that was proposing to his uh, girlfriend, wanting her to become the fiance, got down on one knee. They, it was a sunset on the beach, and he, he, he's proposing. and says, you know, I, I want you to be my wife. And, and he says, you know, I, I love you, and, and I promise that I'll be a good father if we have kids. And, and you know, I, I will be the most wonderful husband. Except one, day, one week of the year, I'd like to go out with my old girlfriend. Remember that? And what's the gal do? Slap, slap, slap. What, what's wrong with you? There's unfaithfulness. Unfaithfulness. Faithfulness here is that you, you, you are reliable, trustworthy to have eyes for only one person, your spouse. Faithfulness. You don't get distracted by all the others. You live for, you're willing to die for that other person. That's faithfulness. 
faithful to a spouse. It shows up as being a faithful brother, a faithful brother. Uh, says here in Peter, with the help of Silas, whom I regard a faithful brother. Now, Silas is not his physical brother. Uh, Peter's writing this. It's not his physical brother. Uh, he, he, he's a Gentile convert through the, the ministry of the Apostle Paul. He's not even Jewish. He says, but he's my faithful brother. I can count on him. I can rely on him. There's several of these guys. Timothy was faithful. These guys that you could... That's what the church is. We are a church family. We just took in another member into our church family today, two of them. One by baptism, one by, by membership, all having been already previously baptized. They are now family. Family looks out for family. And we're to be faithful brothers to one another. We're, we're to be there for each other. Faithful brother, faithful brother. In Revelation chapter 2, we would be a faithful witness Yet you remain true to my name. That's faithful. You did not renounce your faith in me, even in the days of Antipas. Now, in the days of Antipas, this is at Pergamos. Uh, Antipas is a guy who actually was executed for his faith. And it, most commentators are pretty much agreed that the problem at Pergamos was they had entered uh, emperor worship and that you had to renounce your faith in Christ and Pledge your faith to the emperor that he was your God, your savior, your king, your Lord. And Antipas apparently does not do that, so he is a faithful, and the word for witness is literally, because the Greek word for witness is martyr. Martyr. He was faithful to what he believed, even to the point of death. That's pretty faithful. He's not turning back. He's not re reneging. He's standing firm. He's standing true. He's not falling for the politically correct. You see, politically correct, he should have renounced his faith and said emperor is king. Listen, there may come a day here, even in America, where if we don't bow to political correctness, it may cost us our lives to hold tenaciously to our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He was a faithful witness. A faithful follower. In Revelation, it talks about Jesus Christ going to return one day, and, and uh, the people of the earth will make war against the Lamb, but the Lamb, that's the name for Jesus, He's the Lamb of God. The Lamb will overcome them because He is Lord of lords and King of kings, and with Him will be, be His called, chosen, and faithful followers. It's not just enough to start well. We've got to finish well. It's not, not enough just to take the first steps of faith. We've got to continue in faith. He says, they were faithful followers. They're coming back with Jesus. And Jesus and this army are going to bring the final kingdom to earth uh, called the millennial kingdom of Christ, a faithful follower. Here's another one. I just looked up. There, there's these concepts of faithful in the Bible. A joyful, be joyful in hope, patience in affliction, and faithful in prayer. Faithful in prayer. If I were to ask, what is the prayer request you've been praying for the longest and say, how long have you been praying for it? I think some of us would be a little like, well, I don't know. I don't have any of them that I've prayed for a long time. It's because we are very impatient Americans, Right? I realized how impatient we were when I was warming up the baby's bottle and the baby was crying. <laughs> and I'm saying, in two minutes, you'll have a bottle. We've done this so many times. You should know, like Pavlov's dog, as soon as that thing dings, you get in a bottle. But instead, he cried all the more, or more and more, like, I want it and I want it now. Prayer warriors, faithful in prayer. Day in, day out, sometimes for the same thing. I have a time of prayer, prayer, I have a place of prayer, and I take things to the Lord in prayer. I am a prayer warrior. I'm faithful in prayer. A faithful servant. This is what takes us back to the verse where we first started, where it says there, it says, now it is required of those who have been given a trust that they must prove faithful. Certified, proven, faithful. So what does faithfulness actually look like? Well, Jesus told us what faithfulness kind of looked like. He said there was a man who was going on a journey. 
that man is really him. He's going back into heaven and he's on a journey. But in the story, he doesn't tell us that. We're, we're to read between the lines what the story means. He said, the man goes on a journey, and before he goes on a journey, he gathers his servants together, and he disperses into their trust all of his assets. And in the story, he divides them this way. To the one man, he gave five talents of money. To another one, he gave two talents. Another servant, he gave two talents. And then to one, he gave just one talent. And then it says this, each according to his ability. I figured it out. I'm not a millionaire because it's not according to my ability. <laughs> I guess. I think God called me to be a preacher because that's according to my ability. He may have called you to be a teacher, a factory worker. He may have called you right now to be a student, Whatever it is, it's according to the ability. He said, God entrusted gifts, talents, abilities. He gave those to you. And so he goes off on the trip, and the man who he had given five talents to went out at once and put the money to work, and it gained five more. Whoa. Why? He's faithfully doing something with the ability that God had given him. It says, and the man who had two, man, he went out and he, he put it to work and he got two more. Most of you know this story. Then there was the man who received the one talent. And he went off, he dug a hole in the ground, and he hid his master's money. <laughs> he buried it. And those of you who know the story, it says that the master returned and he summoned them to see what they had done with what he had given them. And uh, to the one man that had got, gotten the five, he says, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Why? He's faithful. We look for faithful people. Those are the ones we want to give the most important task to because they will execute it. And he says, listen, I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. He turned to the guy that just got two, and he says, well done, good and faithful servant, because he said, hey, I got two, and I produced two. He says, you have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. Well, then he came to the man with the one talent, and he said, I was afraid, and I went out, and I hid your talent in the ground. Uh, see, here's what belongs to you. He dug it up, and he gave him that dirty old coin. <laughs> Here you go. His master replied, you wicked, you wicked, you lazy servant. Take the talent from him and give it to the one who has the ten talents. And then Jesus says this, for everyone who has will be given more and he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. Then he says this, throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Very regretful, remorseful situation. He's cast out. Now there's an obvious contrast. Remember when I had the four chairs up here? Remember when I had the four chairs? And I had the four chairs up here that there's an obvious contrast, I think, between the worthless servant chair number one, remember chair number one? And chair number four, the spiritual guy. I think this is the same contrast. You see, the worthless guy is the guy without the spirit of God. He's got emptiness. He only lives for himself. He was afraid of the master and out of his own fears, he buried what he had and did nothing for the master. The guy with the two, the guy with the, the, the five, he said, man, I'm going to use what God gave me for God's glory. And he invested his life in things that really mattered and produced for the glory of God. And the carnal man, remember we had the four chairs? We had the natural man, the carnal man, the infantile new believers trying to grow into a spiritual believer. These two guys over here are so concerned about themselves without God in their life. Well, they're having a wonderful time, but they are worthless wicked servants. The other two are spiritual, good, faithful servants. The contrast is obvious. So how do you become more faithful? 
All right, first of all, it begins by putting your trust in God. You have to put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. You have to, you have to at some point acknowledge I'm a sinner, that Christ died on the cross for my sins. I'm accepting his payment for my sin as being sufficient to save me, and I'm yielding my life to him as my Savior, my Lord, my God. You make the first step of being a Christian. You accept Jesus as your Savior. And then you walk in the Spirit. At the moment you receive Christ, you get the Holy Spirit. He's going to prompt you in what is right to do, and you know what it is. You know it's not from yourself. God is prompting you, and you follow that prompting of the Holy Spirit in your life, and you live in His Word. The Bible is so important because the Bible is inspired by the Spirit of God. It is God's message to you. So you have to live in the Word. I don't know of a spiritual person I don't believe there is one who is not in the Word. You have to be in the Word of God to become a spiritual person. You just have to, because that's your link to God. God speaks through His Word. Then when you, you're in the Word and you read the Word, you discover what the Word says for your life, you then got to yield to the Word and do His will. A lot of people have the Word up here. They know it, but not here out of their heart to do it, to do it, to do it. And finally, you continue in prayer. That's what this passage talk. You become a prayer warrior. You see, the word, through the word, God speaks to you. Through prayer, you speak to God. And between that, you begin to have a genuine, real, personal relationship with the true and living God through our Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. That's what you do. That's what we say. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, uh, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, faithfulness. You see, it's actually produced by the Holy Spirit when you become a Christian and you're walking in the Spirit. You can become more faithful. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're thankful for your word. We're thankful, Lord, for, for the baptism today and the faith that it expressed we're thankful for the addition of a new member, uh, Lord, that's come by previous baptism. We're thankful, Lord, but there may be someone here who does not know Jesus today. Right now, in the quietness of the moment, they could just call out and say, Lord, I don't have the, all the proper language, but I know in my heart I want you to be my Savior, to be my Lord, to be my God. Save me. Make me your child. We know, Lord, that it's not a prayer that saves a person. It's the Lord Jesus Christ that saves us. And if anyone would just be honest and reach out through a prayer in faith, you will recognize that and save them. So may this be the day of salvation for someone we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.
faithful for all my years. With one breath you make me new. Your grace covers all I do. Apostle Paul tells Timothy, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I'm the chief. I mean, the, the, the Bible message, the gospel, is a gospel of hope. He did not come into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. We have a saving God. You can count on that. You can take that to the bank. He is faithful that any time you cry out for help and deliverance and salvation, he will hear you and he will answer you. For all who call upon the name of the Lord shall not be disappointed. He's faithful. It's up to us to reciprocate that and be faithful to him. Father, we're dismissing now on the thought of your faithfulness to us that we can always count on you anytime, any place, anywhere. Just cry out and you'll hear us. We're asking that your spirit would prompt us that we would be faithful. Faithful to you. That, Lord, that we would uh, take all that you've given us in our lives our abilities, our money, our friends, our family, our desires, all of that. And prove to be faithful unto you that we might hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy that is my joy. For that we long, O Lord. Bless us now on this Lord's day. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a wonderful Lord's Day. And don't forget that uh, it's at Highland Grill uh, for the Lunch Bunch. And the youth, we're going to go segueing.